Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, Melissa and I are so happy tonight to be able to sing for you. We're going to sing uh, Fall on Me, which was um, written by Andrea Bocelli and his son Matteo. And the words in this song are really, really beautiful. It's um, a duet. Uh, part of it's in English and part of it's in Italian. So before we start, I thought I could just read to you um, the English translation for the Italian part, just so you know what we're going to be singing. <laughs> A light illuminates you. Always follow it. You know it will guide you. Don't give up. Be careful not to lose yourself and your past will fall away. I would like you to believe in yourself in every step you take. It's an infinite journey. I'll smile with you as you take me with you. School. 
Mm. Oh, welcome everyone. <laughs> <Yeah. was> <laughs> mm, Merry Christmas. The, the holiday spirit <laughs> yeah. is descending on us all. <laughs> what a beautiful start of the evening and of the whole weekend. That song just was so beautiful and actually remind me of, I think there's a workbook lesson. Jesus says that there's a light in you that can never die. You know, it's like this bright light and I watch Jeff and the background of Jeff with this deep dark blue sky with the light shining through and that's that's what we're here to remember the light in us that can never die And I feel that this is so important. I feel so honored that you all are here showing up and choose to join in remembering this light that is in us, that is walking beside us. You know, Jesus said, who is walking with you? This question should be asked a thousand times a day. And this is what we're here together to remember. I was talking with Laverne last week and we just have this beautiful mystical moment where some, something just remembered about our mission. And it's, it's really beyond words and beyond description. In, in our journey, we suddenly remembered you know, we're not this body, we're here to, we're meeting in this specific time and space for a holy mission, and this mission is so big, it's beyond this time, it's beyond this life, lifeline, it's beyond our linear life and perception. And our mission is just to come together in remembering remembering this holiness inside of us. So we feel like, I feel this is right now with all of you. This is why we show up here in this very moment. Mm. Yeah, it's always so beautiful seeing all these faces. I know some of you are stretched across the world in different time zones. I've seen during the warm-up wiping your eyes and, and just to be there and be with us and be awake. And, and uh, yeah, even in my life it would take something profound for me to set my alarm. I enjoyed having a good night's sleep, but to, to get up, <laughs> to watch something, wherever you are, yeah, we're just so honored. And it is a sacred calling. It's like there's this remembrance in us that it seems for much of our lives it's very faint. Mm. And then uh, we never know quite when it will emerge or when it will shine through in such a strong way, but when it does happen, then we're quite certain that, oh, this is why I'm here. This is the purpose of everything that I seem to be doing. Uh, everything that I've done my entire life was just for this experience, this holiness. And I think it's important that we come together uh, this is quite a celebration because oftentimes we've lived a life where there was not that many witnesses. 
oftentimes our parents weren't telling us we were holy, <laughs> our teachers, our, uh, our partners sometimes, you know, they tell us we were many things, but usually not holy. <laughs> That's not something that, that they tell us. You know, yo, oh, you're so holy. You're just so holy. You know, it's, it's not something we're used to hearing. And so uh, there's something about this time of year, though, just from the, a vague memory of, of, of a celebration of, of an innocence that's prior to this world. Even when we hear the story of, of the babe in Bethlehem and we hear about the star in the sky that the, mm -hmm. the three wise men followed. No, they didn't follow GPS. No, they had no maps. They just were in the dark looking at this bright light and following this light. And in some ways, that's kind of the way it is with our intuitive inner journey. We feel there's a brightness, there's a hope, there's something sparkly inside of us, something innocent, something childlike even, that is still there. And uh, for some of us, we have memories of Christmases, maybe with, with our biological family, Maybe there was just some moments uh, during those Christmases where everything was quiet and still and sparkly and everyone was just gazing at each other with such love and gratitude, grateful that you could be together. And, uh, and yet, I think as Mary wrote in, uh, Mary wrote in her question about specialness, that m many of us have memories uh, I think, Mary, you were saying it's the Christmases were for fun, so much fun with the family, but there was also tension, and occasionally there was conflict that would break through, and then, you know, as Jeff mentioned at the beginning, you know, this idea of giving presents is very strange, this, that our mind would get so focused on giving and receiving of material things, uh, that conditioning I think is just the ego's attempt to help block us from this holiness, from the simplicity mm. of it. And, uh, and we're so grateful for anything that comes to remind us. It wasn't long ago I was talking about my friend Dale who's in prison. He's been in there for a number of years and he's got a number of years to go, but I think uh, tomorrow morning in my session I'm going to pull out that handwritten a uh, letter that he wrote to me uh, that closed with, uh, they sold my typewriter, pardon my, <laughs> pardon my handwriting. But it's, you know, there's those reminders of the simplicity that, that we don't have to do anything for this holiness. We don't mm. have to, we don't have to earn it. We don't have to prove it. We don't have to justify it. We don't have to uh, somehow work hard at it. It's more of what we always call letting go, and like a let go and a surrender. Coming back, back, back in the mind to that innocence that's prior, prior to this world, prior to time, mm -hmm. prior to space, prior to all those, even those memories. The good ones and the bad ones. There's something that's so pristine that it's even prior mm. to that. It's yeah. the I amness. That's what I feel. This weekend, we're not really here to find out like a road map or how to find the holiness or how to find the happiness in the future. This is, we determine to do it now. That's in our joining and in our devotion and in our agreement. We have an agreement that is very sacred, very ancient. We don't just meet for random reasons right now. We come here for an agreement. And this weekend we're here to, to actually tap into that remembrance that is, you know, that help us to remember what, who we truly are with each other. You know, we can't do this on our own. Jesus actually said you can't, you can't even accept correction on your own because in union with me, you know your true self. 
So it's always in the union, it's always in the union with the spirit in each other. He also said in the Course that something to the extent that uh, withholding is dreaming and joining is waking. So in our joining, in our determination to be here together, you know, our work is, is really done. We don't really have more than the willingness to show up here and just to tap into it right now. Like David said, you know, Christmas is such a time on the calendar in the world. It's a time, you know, at the end of the year to celebrate, you know, it's a time for gifts, it's a time for family, for, un for union in the form. But if you look at the course, anything around holiness and around Christmas is always about instant. It has nothing to do with timeline, it has nothing to do with preparation, it has nothing to do with what you need to do in betterment of yourself. It's just something that who you already are and it's an instant that we want to tap into to remember that. So that's the purpose of us coming together this weekend. And every moment when we come together is just for that reason. Yeah. yeah, it's like we've come together in this appointed time to really be shown the meaning of Christmas. You know, this may sound like we're all part of a, a Christmas movie, movie, the meaning of Christmas. We're here, we're here digitally to discover the meaning of Christmas. And, uh, and there's so many famous uh, movies and, and of course there's uh, so many plays and theater plays and I think of the, the Nutcracker Suite. I mean, there's just, it goes on and on. There's so many uh, gifts and expressions of love that come through and yet we're here to be shown by Jesus and the Holy Spirit the meaning of Christmas. And I think it's a way that we have to be open to uh, if we're going to remember the meaning of Christmas, we have to be willing to forget the rest. Yeah. We have to be, be willing to forget whatever we were holding on to, whatever we were clinging on to, whatever we were hoping for in time and space, and come with holy empty hands unto our God to be shown the meaning. Because to me, the meaning is very, very simple. Hmm. It's not uh, coming through learning more concepts. It's not coming from repeating rituals or practicing things over and over in time. It's, a, it's this dropping deep inside, inward, into this place of stillness and, and acceptance. We like the symbols of like a, a, a burning candle or a shining star in the sky. We, uh, before we were coming here, um, it's the simple little gestures, you know, uh, I was uh, saying goodbye to ISO before I came over here with a belly rub, just, he's just laying there on the carpet, like, oh, love me, love me, I'm holy, and I'm like, I know you are, and so it's a nice belly rub, a nice belly rub, and he's just leaning back there, this, that's a simple gesture, the simplicity of holiness has to just come from us so easily. It has to just roll out and radiate from us without any kind of expectations, any hopes or wishes that the world will change or that something should be different in our life. Uh, Diana sent this uh, movie, I think it was called Perfect Christmas. Uh, I saw a link to it on YouTube. There wasn't many views. It was just a handful of us that watched this. But I started watching it today and, and uh, you know, when I was watching it, I could hear Jesus inside saying, you know, what he told us in the Bible, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And then 
how the ego in our mind goes when it hears that, be ye perfect, as your Father in Heaven is perfect, then the ego comes in with bah humbug, perfect. There is no perfect. You will never be perfect. You can forget about perfection. But actually that holiness is perfect. That's, that's why it's holy. <laughs> because it was created by holiness and it is perfect. And, and there is no defense against that, that holiness. There's absolutely no defense. That, you know, all we have to do is begin to discern in our mind that there is another voice, a, an opposing force, that has invented a substitute for perfection. And that substitute is called perfectionism, mm. <laughs> which is this crazy mechanism in our mind that we're trying to, in this case with the movie Perfect Christmas, she was trying to have the perfect Christmas. She was recalling this little train set and this little Christmas village that uh, she had seen as a child and she had told her brother, wonder where this is? And he said, that's just a, a train set in a store window, that's mm. not a real place. But there was something in longing in, in her for there to be that Christmas scene, to have that Christmas that her mother always talked about in Ireland mm. and she wanted to almost like recapture it, recreate it, mm. bring it in. And thus begins the perfectionism, mm. you know, the, the trying to make sure the food is just right, the decorations are just right, make sure that you're, you've got your outfits you want to be wearing, your hair is just right. And all these, every little thing that the ego would tell you, just make sure nothing goes wrong in mm. form. Mm. And that starts to drive us into a search for the perfect, but it's through external means. We're looking somehow to achieve a perfect world or a perfect outcome. And I think that's one thing that Jesus really teaches us in the Course is that peace, peace of mind, mm. is a perfect outcome, but it's not, it doesn't look a certain way. It doesn't have a, an expectation. It doesn't have a particular form associated with it. And that takes a lot to let that go. It's almost like people say, wait a minute, why, why am I educating myself? Why am I working so hard? Why am I striving? Why am I driving myself if there is no perfect form? Uh, why is it that I'm doing this? And I would say it's a, it's a defense mechanism of a perfectionism trying to overcome a, a, a sense of lack and mm -hmm. inadequacy and of just basically feeling alone mm. and not loved. That's, that's the, the fall from grace experience, is feeling alone or mm. isolated, disconnected. And, and that is very dark, like in this world, we try to search and find this love through different means, through, you know, growing up in my own experience, through trying to achieve the worldly accomplishment, approval from the parents, approval from peers and, and everything. And, and yet, until I found the spirit, then all of a sudden, there is something that is fulfilling, that starts to fulfill this hole in the heart, starts to fulfill. And yet, the ego still comes in to say, seek elsewhere. You know, it can't be that simple. It can be that simple. It's complicated. You know, you need to find love from this place, from this place, from everywhere else. But you can't just go simply into the mind and call spirit's name, because that's way too simple. But over the years, what I found out is that it actually is that simple. The moment I'm willing to say all these problems that I'm facing, and I quit to try to find the answer, and I literally just go inward to say, Spirit, Spirit, I'm with you now. Immediately, that's where the peace comes. And, and I feel like the best way for me to describe this journey is is a gradual, um, a gradual journey of choosing only that. 
So that choice has always been there from the beginning. I could always choose the spirit among all the different choices. And the journey is literally a journey of eventually have everything simplified to only one choice all the time. And that's it. That's it. There is no other learning. There is no other effort. It's just somehow, you know, it takes as long as it takes for the, for the mind to, to be willing to say, okay, I'm, I quit to choose anything else. And spirit is the only choice. And I think that is why Jesus says, let this, this year be different make this year different by making it all the same. He literally means that do not have different purpose in any decision. You know, choose to see everything with the same purpose. Choose to behold holiness in everything you see and everyone you meet. And choose to see everything with me. And there's no other purpose in absolutely anything in life and when that becomes simple when that becomes single then that becomes very very simple very simple life and fulfilling life it's the answer to everything you know just just to tell yourself i am a bringer of love i am a bringer of light i am a bringer of joy that is my only purpose. That is my only function. I have no other function. All other make-believe functions are meaningless. They're irrelevant. Imagine as a child, you know, if you were just at the point where you were beginning to understand your parent and, and the words of your parent and then and your mother or your dad just pulled you aside and said, come here, just sit on my knee for a minute and just listen to me. Uh, and then whispered into your ear, you are here to bring joy. That is the only reason you are here. And you should live your life from a place of joy. What really, really makes you happy is going to to bring happiness to everyone. It will, it will come through you. It will be given you if it is what you desire to be your function. And imagine with, with parents or teachers or guidance counselors or advisors uh, all the way through our life, imagine if we had, had this voice telling us, remember, just be joyful. Don't be concerned about the way things work out. Don't try to judge what's best in terms of the world. You're just here to, to bring that joy, to bring that happiness. And, and that is what holiness is. Holiness is happy and holiness extends that joy and that happiness. Even in Christmas, you know, a lot of people remember people, carolers going around and singing, you know, it's a dark, cold night and then all of a sudden you see there's there's a group of people outside and and you look and they've got some lights and some candles and then they start singing in the dark and you can hear it outside your door and you open your door up and then there's a whole group of people singing to you <laughs> serenading you and that's the joy of of caroling you know it's almost a, a reflection right from the bible mm. make a joyful noise unto the lord mm. well caroling is a pretty joyful noise it sounds pretty good it's not <laughs> it, it really is, is is great and that's kind of the way our life is to be we're we're to have that song going inside of us mm. and radiating and singing through us whether we're singing the in music or words or whether we're just it's our attitude that is is singing that's really what the the spirit of of christmas is all about and i think you know the ego will come in like well yeah 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 that sounds uh bah terrible bah humbug it just doesn't like the whole idea of joy and happiness and it just doesn't believe that that's practical 
And it took me a lot of years, you know, to start to just keep going inside to that and going, hmm, how do I feel about that? What is my motive underneath my actions? What is the motive underneath my behaviors? Am I inspired? Am I doing this out of a sense of joy and happiness? And I think progressively as I started to just give myself over to this calling, mm -hmm. then I could be up all hours of the day or, and night uh, doing things, uh, whether it's outside or at a computer. A lot of it was just uh, communication things, way more communication than I ever imagined was even possible. Uh, but it was just an, inspira an inspiration coming through. It was inspired communication. It wasn't, I should answer an email, or I have to make a post, or I have to talk to somebody on the phone, or I have to do a video chat. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was, it was just a steady impulse after impulse to to reach out, to connect, to, to extend. And then uh, happily, I find it in the parable of David, as I kept moving along, um, lo and behold, the technologies kept increasing. You know, I would be going along and, and uh, I'd be on the internet and Jesus would say, you know, you know, pay attention, VoIP is coming. And I'd be like, VoIP? VoIP? Some of you know what VoIP is, voice over internet protocol, I would be like, what is VoIP? And he's like, oh, it's going to bring your phone bill down. <laughs> that's, a, that's what he told me. You, I need you to be communicating. It's going to bring, this was back years ago, it'll bring your phone bill down. Okay, all right, I'll try it. Mm. And then uh, years go by, you know, when Skype first came out, we were we were like, what is this Skype thing? Well, for many, many years, I don't even count how many years, we, we've, I've just enjoyed doing Skype chats and Skype video chats and doing these one-on-one -on -one Skype chats. I don't know, there was a time in my life where I was doing so many Skype chats that I had friends in different parts of the world. I had a friend, uh, Anna, in Sweden, and you know, Sweden's famous for ABBA mm -hmm. and you know, music and everything. And, so she would get on there and get all dressed up, and she would put on. She would start pa uh, pantomiming. Uh, she would start lip syncing all these uh, songs, and her her three little children were like uh, her background singers. They'd be all dressed up, and and they'd be singing and twirling in the background, and and our Skype calls turned into like a like a show, and that was just happiness. That's the best use of Skype. I still have never found a better use of Skype than seeing my friend Anna lip syncing songs in pure joy with her little kids in the background, like her little pips uh, in the background, swirling and dancing, and, and you know, just for the joy of it. Uh, mm. It's just opportunities to extend joy is really all the world is for. And we're not really meant to get pulled down emotionally into make-believe problems mm. that were just made up by the ego to be distractions away from our joy and our holiness. I remember uh, recently I was talking to JP and he, he said when he was just he graduated from college and all this uh, pressure about the future and he had to make something happen for his future was so stressful for him. It was so stressful that it will lock him down to some kind of, he almost can get blackout from mm. that kind of stress. And something happened that he got unemployment because his company moved to, the, to another state. He chose not to go, so the unemployment came and he just started to think, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do whatever I want for a period of time and see what happens. So he started just to dive into what his heart was truly wanting, like meditation, little walk in the park, and little by little, the money just like rushing into his account nonstop. And at some point he made this connection. He said, well, maybe that's all I need to do just to be happy. 
and all the other money, financial issues, and the stress will never show up if I choose to follow that. And that is how he launched into this spiritual path. And recently, we were just talking, and we said, you know, we offic it's official. We beat the system, the ego system. Our life, <laughs> we don't ever believe that there's a problem truly need to be solved anymore. Because all that we have done all these years was following this joy and this calling and just give ourselves over to it again and again and again. And we see, we witness firsthand that all problems and limitations and lack disappear in our awareness. And if we give that as our priority, we give the problems a priority in our life and try to give our time and energy to solve those problems and hoping that happiness will wait after all those problems were solved, I can tell you that is a dark hole. There's no end to that. Happiness will never happen after problems are solved because the problems are not meant to be solved. That's like a system that just never gonna dissolve until we choose to step out in our mind. So we're just like feeling, wow, we're so grateful, you know, with, with that kind of guidance someone from outside of time and space somehow made his appearance to our awareness and we got a, we have the way shower we have many companions and we can truly follow it step by step yes it can be scary if we listen to the ego's voice and yet it is a much much easier life much much easier yeah yeah, it's great to have the contrast because, uh, you know, when Jesus starts talking about our, our mind, our holy mind, uh, living in the mind of God, that we are an idea in the mind of God, he, he gets firmer and firmer and firmer in the Course. He says, you are mind, holy mind, purely mind. You are not mind-body. Jesus is not even a fan of mind-body-spirit festivals, you know. He's like, why would you go to that? When, when you're a mind, you're purely mind, you're a divine mind, you're not a body, you've never been a body, and frankly, if you just give the use of that body over to the Holy Spirit for a while, you'll forget that you're a body. That body will disappear from your awareness. Because, number one, God didn't create it, God doesn't even know about it, and so why would you keep your mind so limited and so fixated on something that doesn't even exist? So people say, that's, that's kind of strong. Yeah, he says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It's always remembered or anticipated. It's this mesmerism of time. It's just, a, it's just an invention of the ego. It's just a game. And yet, if you're honest and you take a look at your daily life and your top 40 thoughts that are on your top 40 moving through there, you'll see that they're very body related. And, and so, you start off thinking, well, I'm a human being among other human beings. You might be wearing a t-shirt that says, I am a body, I exist in time and space, I exist in I must meet my needsville. <laughs> I must meet my needsville. That's the name of my cosmos. I must meet my needsville. Today, again, I must meet my needsville. There's no free lunch. The government not, is not going to meet my needs. It's a hostile world, the ego says, and you've you got to survive. You're a body that's got to survive. No wonder JP was, JP was blacking out, uh, thinking of the future, because it, yeah, it's enough to make you black out. <laughs> it's, it's stressville, is I must meet my needsville. And if you go through your whole day, how am I going to meet my, meet my needs today? How am I going to meet my needs today? If that's all your mind is occupied with, is just meeting body needs, mm -hmm. then that, that's very dark. You know, you're not going to know your own holiness. 
what Jesus is training us to do through all this mind training is he's, he's teaching us, he says the body is outside you but it seems to surround you, shutting you off from others. He says it right there, the body is outside you. <laughs> The body is outside you. The body is not in your divine mind. The body is outside you. It's a distraction. It's a cloaking device, like the Klingon's head in, in Star Trek. It's a cloaking device to keep you from knowing who you are as a spiritual being. And so, if you're just focused on meeting body needs all day long, you're not really giving space for that holy instant, that, that moment of recognition. Mm -hmm. That moment when you just relax and in your mind you're just smiling like, ah. Oh. And, and so you're not, you're not going to go from this fixation on the body to pure spirit without a transition. And that transition is your purpose. It's your life's calling. It's your function. That's going to help your mind rise up to, you know, love lift us up where we belong, the Joe Cocker song. That's, that's what that whole song is about, is, is coming up higher and higher. What was it? Steve Winwood had a song, Bring me higher love, ho. Oh. You know, all these songs, popular songs that are calling on a higher love. Mm -hmm. And it just takes the willingness to relax into your function, like JP did. You know, he, he basically, his, his company said, we're moving. He said, I'm not going. He got his unemployment, and then after that, he started just relaxing and saying, well, I better do what's important to me. I better spend my day, I better give my day over to what's really inspiring and important to me, and not keep playing into the mesmerism of, of need and lack. You know, it, it's, it's not really a life if you feel like you're treading water and you're just trying to keep your chin above the top of the water so you don't drown. That's very fearful to keep flapping around in the water just to try to keep your chin above the water so you don't drown. That's, that's not a motivation that will take you to who you really are. It's just a, a very fearful motivation. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, through our lives and through the lives of those in our community, some, somewhere, somehow, someplace, they heard a call and they just said, I'm going for it. I really feel this. Mm -hmm. I trust I will be taken care of. I trust I am not having to provide for my own needs personally, mm -hmm. but there is a presence that loves me so much and believes in me so much and believes in my holiness and knows my holiness so much that, that it will take me home. It will beam me up. It will take me in the tractor beam and I won't, there will be nothing I can do to stop it mm -hmm. <laughs> once, I, once I give myself over to it. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. It's very powerful and it's very um, like the Spirit or Jesus is, is guiding us in a very, very specific and practical way. And I always feel like if Jesus can reach me, He can reach absolutely anyone because I have no background whatsoever that is even can open my mind up to Jesus. But somehow, you know, just one day all of a sudden, you know, in my early 20s, I started to feel, who is Jesus? Maybe I, I want to know more, just out of the blue. And from that point on, just something started to open up. But it was not through a book, it was not through parents, it was through not, not through anything. Something just, when it's time, it started to reach. And I have just keep seeing it over and over again that the Spirit reaches us in ways that we don't expect and we don't have to even do anything. You know, at some point when I opened the course, um, Jesus said, your path is different. A holy relationship will be given you. And it took me a few years to realize he was really talking to me, like not a million other people, but very specifically to me and I better listen. He said, a holy relationship will be given you. 
you, meaning you, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> and I am talking to you right now. So it's like there is a tension that needs to be, you know, needs to be paid. And, and I just started to realize, wow, Spirit or Jesus is right by my side and give me very personal instructions along the way who to meet, what to say, you know, what to eat even. Everything was very, very specific, but not really for any purpose, not for the purpose of maintaining the body, but it's all for the purpose of remembrance. Like the mind start to remember more and more and more. So I, that's why I feel at this point, you know, it feels like a time of celebration because it is a time of relaxation. Sitting here, I truly feel that how lucky, how grateful we are that we don't really need to do anything because our holiness is already here and is guiding us all along, has been guiding us all along and will continue to very, very specifically. And there is no mistake, there is no mess messing up that is ever possible. So that's what I feel is truly what we're here to celebrate, the good news. Yeah. I think you can, you can also be ready to know that it, it's going to be quite funny uh, when, when you start to give yourself over and say, all right, Spirit, you use the body, it's just going to be, you're just going to have some surreal funny moments where you just are smiling going, I can't even imagine this. Like I remember uh, there was a point where Francis told me, well, I, I told my mom I was a minister and her mom just burst into laughter that Francis was a minister. It would be like Francis saying, hi, mom, I'm I'm purple now. I mean, that's, imagine telling your parents that you're purple. You know, that's about how, how regular that was for your mom to hear, I'm a minister. Uh, it was so out of pattern. It was so unfathomable, because Francis comes from a family that, you know, they were, you know, not but just a family, but a whole country. A whole country and family that's, that's no. that were not into really, uh, religion or spirituality. You can't really say that for all of China because there's some pretty deep non-dual teachers, but in right. your circles, right. I for you to I be a that. minister is about is like you turning purple one day and saying, I'm purple, mom. Yeah. Okay. And for me, it was a little bit different in the sense I was raised in a, Christ, a church and religious family and everything. But I was one of those that pretty much sat in the church and couldn't wait for the sermon to be over and couldn't wait to get out of the church and get out into the sunshine. I wanted to get away from it. And then after years of, with the Course and letting the Holy Spirit speak through me, I found myself one time, I, re I remember I was up in Lansing, Michigan, and I was invited to a church. I'd been going mainly to course groups and talking to people, but that, that, that church invitation, I remember I was just like, I heard m my mouth opening saying, sure. And then I remember going to the church and I was just smiling thinking, oh my God. And then I got there to the, to the church service late. So the minister was still talking and then the minister was up behind a pulpit. And then the minister went, oh, there's David. He's going to address us tonight. And I remember walking up the <laughs> aisle towards this pulpit going, this is surreal. You know, people talk about a walk-in. It's like the Holy Spirit is walking me up to a pulpit, to stand behind a pulpit in a church. And I was just laughing on the inside, going, okay, you got me. Because <laughs> I had no idea what I would say. Everybody, the whole congregation waiting, you know. <laughs> I have no notes, I have nothing. And just, there you go, walked right up. And then, boom, the Holy Spirit gave the whole talk and it was really funny. I, I enjoyed it. I think everybody enjoyed it too, but that's what I mean. It's, it's involuntary. Francis came from 
from a family and a, a, a city and a culture that had no inkling of anything to do with the, the spirit. It was all about achievement and, and productivity and family and all those things. And, and for me, I didn't really aspire to go give a talk behind a pulpit. That's the last place I would have ever uh, imagined myself and yet it was like, oh this is surreal. And, but I'm telling you this because this is what we're talking about, about this surrender. It's not like you just can keep twinkling your nose and saying, I am not a body. I am not a body. I am not a body. You can't do that for hundreds of hours and expect that, that this is going to achieve the goal. It's more that you have to be in that total surrender and just say, okay, I believe that I, I'm looking at a world of time and space, but you're telling me that, that actually this isn't the fact of the matter. And I'm going to have to be guided, I'm going to have to let go of this faulty perception of reality, of this fixed belief in limitation, in lack, in competition, in comparison. I'm going to have to let go of the fixed belief in these crazy ideas, crazy concepts. And, and to do that, I'm going to have to allow myself to be used. If this body, for example, is a puppet, I'm going to have to give over the strings. You know, that was my friend Resta, that was her prayer all the time. She always heard me using that marionette um, metaphor over and over until finally one day, you know, when she was going through some struggles, she just said, Holy Spirit, put me back on the, on the strings. Like, I do not want to be in charge. I, I'm, I'm tired of playing Pinocchio. I'm tired of, tired of trying to be a real human being. I, I, I want to get back on the strings. And, and that's what I mean by giving yourself over to your calling. You already know I, deep down what this calling is. You, you already have something in your heart that's swirling in there. There's something inside that's swirling and it's going, oh, that would be really fun and joyful. And then of course this other voice, the voice of, of the ego, is going to try to drown that out. And Oh, don't be ridiculous. Have you lost your mind? Be practical. You know, it's going to go on and on and on to try to shut that off. But mm. we're saying, go for it. <laughs> Make this year different by making it all the same. Making it all the same by, by not emphasizing certain days as holidays. Mm. Okay, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, all right. It's, you know, at first we're happy to have something to celebrate. That's why we celebrate birthdays, right? It's pretty dark and dismal in this uh, make, I've got to meet my Meadsville universe. We, you know, it's pretty dark, so it's good to celebrate some things. So, so we have some holidays and some special days and events to celebrate. Even with Helen Shuckman, you know, Jesus would say, uh, it's okay that you take a vacation from work. Jesus would tell them. Because Hel Helen was like almost like a workaholic. She was a research psychologist and she was working up there at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center and Jesus would say he would reach her right where her mind believed it was, which was in a stressful career. Mm. And Jesus comes in like a ray of light through that thick belief system and says, it's okay to take a vacation. It's okay to take time off of work and give yourself a vacation. That's where it starts. It starts with, with something where you feel like you're going to be gentle with yourself, you're going to be good to yourself, you're going to relax, mm. you're going to take it easy on yourself. And then as this heart starts to open, crack open, and you get more into your function, and, and miraculously all your needs are met, mm. not in I have to meet my own needsville, but miraculously, wow, I didn't see that one coming. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, thank you, thank you, JP. <laughs> gets money coming into his account when he's not working. Right. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how the Spirit gets your attention. And then it starts to open up and you start to build a momentum. Like, okay, this is, I'm the light of the world. So if I'm the light of the world, I guess uh, whatever I need will be provided for me to do my 
Light of the World gig, you know, so for a time, because it really isn't a gig, it's actually a reality, it's a state of, of eternity, mm. but it starts off as, as a gig, because you believe in time and space, you need a few gigs, <laughs> so that's the way that it works. <laughs> Oh, sweet. That's sweet. You, you may be surprised with when this thing starts to come through you. You know, I, I know for me, I guess there came a point, I mean, I always enjoyed music, but I, I never really gave myself hours a day to listen to music, until I did. <laughs> I did. I just let the music, I put my headphones on or I'd, I'd crank it up and I would just let my heart swell and open up and let the music take me. And, uh, and then it was the same with movies, you know. I mean, I enjoyed a, a movie occasionally, a movie here or there, but I never allowed myself to go watch three movies in a row <laughs> until I did. And I'd, it was like, I was so high, I thought, wow, that was great three guided movies in a row. And I've got so many parables of, of even how the Spirit, when I was on the road once, guided me to go see, watch these two movies in a row and they had all these parallels and there was all these lessons I was learning and, and I remember that with some friends of mine I would call them up and uh, like, okay, hey, let's go to the matinee and they would say, but it's like, it's Tuesday. I said, yeah, I know, it's bargain matinee. Come on, come with me and everything. They'd say, David, it's the work week. It's Tuesday afternoon. I'd say, try it, try it. Just come out with me to the movie. So I remember this one woman came with me and, and we watched the movie and I was all high after the movie and, and I said, how was it for you? She said, all I could think about during the whole movie when I was watching the movie was that there are millions and millions of people that are at work slaving at jobs all over the world and I'm here feeling so guilty in this movie theater watching a bark and matinee Tuesday movie with you. I said, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> I was like, like, I cannot take your thoughts away from you, but that's not the best use of a bark and matinee Tuesday. Go and have some fun, be inspired. Have your heart crack open, be lifted up, you know, that's what movies are for. That's what music is for. Be intoxicated by God, you know, that's what movies and music... But you have to realize, you're going to have to start to give yourself over. To me, this was all part of my mind training. I actually had to make a flip from feeling guilty about mind training, feeling guilty about doing the course, feeling guilty about meditating, being guilty about doing all these spiritual practices to actually one day going, well, wait a minute, what if this is all the most practical thing mm -hmm. I can be doing to fulfill mm -hmm. my happiness and my joy, to be enjoying, and maybe what if all the other stuff that I felt guilty about not doing enough of, maybe that was the trick. Maybe this, <laughs> this spiritual discipline and mind training is actually what I should be doing all the time. <laughs> well, the ego is screaming after I had that session, you know, it's like, that's terrible, bah, humbug, that's awful. You're going to end up a, a bag lady, a, a street person. You, are, you have gone too far now, you're off, you have lost it, you have lost your marbles. But actually I thought, I feel pretty good. I feel really good now. Now I live with a bunch of people who, who do the same thing. Well, feeling good, you know, become more and more valuable. Like if there is a moment of feeling good, 
like that becomes so magnified in the awareness okay this is is so important and the rest of the moments if there's heaviness the problems to be solved becomes less valuable to the mind that's what i noticed gradually is because originally when the problems are always there my mind was very much wanting to solve the problem wanted to go into it wanted to discuss it and solve it but more and more it becomes just like I don't even want to go there anymore. I want to focus on what makes me feel good and do more and more and more of that, making sure that that is my focus of my mind. And it's very, very counterintuitive. It's very counter what the ego wants us to do. But that is actually working, working really well. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. You just start to notice more of the witnesses. Like today, uh, I just was in this big, beautiful, empty house. I look around, I see Iso likes to just basically sleep, get his tummy rub, eat. He looks like the Buddha now. He's become the Buddha cat. Because uh, he's just, he doesn't really have a care in the world. So we've got Buddha cat there, and then today, Chella, the cleaner, was over there, and Chella comes over, and she's just smiling, rosy cheeks. She's so happy. She puts on her earbud, and she loses herself in the music. She's probably there for like five, five hours cleaning the place, immaculately clean. And she's just—I see her out there in the sunshine, and she's got her earbuds on, and she's wiggling and shaking and everything. This is; these are the reflections, you know. If house cleaning can be that as ecstatic, if house cleaning can be that joyful, then why not? Why not let it be that? You know, she loves it. For her, it's her time with God. You know, her body's moving, cleaning, but her earbuds are in and she's going. And you can tell she's actually having fun. She's actually enjoying it. And if our eyes meet during the day, she's smiling at me and I'm smiling at her. Oh, there's a kitty cat that came in in South Africa. <laughs> as soon as I start talking about cats, I, I notice them on the screen. I was just down there, Catherine. I recognize that one. I recognize that one. So, but the, these are the witnesses you call forth. And your mind just starts to soar because you know, you're in your function, you're in your joy, and you're in your joy for the whole universe. It's not just you individually. When you go into this innocence and this holiness and this happiness, you're doing it for the whole universe because there's only one of us, really. This idea of fragmentation and separate persons and separate bodies is, is the trick. And Jesus tells us in, in Lesson 132, he does, he says there is no world apart from what you think. So, you know, if you're thinking happy thoughts and you're thinking with your creator, then there is no world apart from what you think. Then it means the whole world is happy. You know, it's like that song, when you're smiling, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. And when you're laughing, when you're laughing, the whole world laughs with you. It's the same idea that Jesus is teaching in Lesson 132. There is no world apart from what you think. It's a perceptual dream. And if the dreamer is happy, that means everything in the dream is happy. Because there is no world apart from your mind. There is no world apart from what you think. And when you have, believe you have problems, then you, it's like you, your mind generates a dream in which there seems to be problems all over the place. Uh, many different levels and layers of problems. Political problems, pol problems with the environment or pollution, uh, racial, ethnic problems, there seems to be envy and greed and, and all different types of competition. If that's what you want, then that's it. 
it's like the ego is like, if you want it, here it is, come and get it. But you better hurry because it may not, you know, it's always, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to you at your own beckoning, at your own wish. Because your mind is that powerful. If you want to be happy, there's nothing that can stop you from being happy because you are created happy. And that's more natural to be happy than anything else. But if you want to hold on to a false identity and you want to play little and you want to play limit and you want to play I must meet my needsville, if you want to keep playing that game, then that's the perception that you, you hold as your reality. Not that it is reality, but it's just the one that's held. So this is the time of holiness. This is the mm. birth of holiness. This is that seed of glory in the mind that says, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be limited in any way. Because it's only your mind that brings forth your experiences. The world cannot make you feel a certain way. The world cannot generate feelings. The world is a projection of feelings. And egoic feelings produce egoic perceptions. And, and Jesus is just saying, this need not be. Mm. There is another way. Mm. That's beautiful. The birth, the birth of holiness is not like we're here to solve problems. Because I remember, you know, in, in my own journey, you know, sickness and body symptoms ha has been like something that is really weighing on my mind. If my body has some kind of symptoms or if I perceive other people's body have symptoms, there is like such a weight on my mind because I want to solve it and there is no way to solve it. So I would go into all kinds of things, mechanisms, cause and effect, food, diet, or even cause and effect in terms of thoughts. But that is still a cause and effect and pro level confusion. Until the moment I decided that none of those body symptom problems, whether it's on this body or on anybody's body, will make me unhappy. I decided that I would choose to be happy regardless of what's going on. And that was such a, a moment of um, declaration to myself. I said I would never let any of it to become a reason for me to have any heaviness or concern. I will always choose to be happy and let, let the form be whatever they are. And they started to lose their purpose for me. You know, the ego started to lose the purpose because every problem has their purpose. The purpose is so that you choose something else than happiness. That's why the ego will get you. You know, it doesn't matter the problem. It can be economic problem, it can be sickness problem, it can be any problem. At the moment that it serves a purpose to distract our mind from choosing our holiness, then the ego keeps serving the, pro the, the purpose. So I, I just notice that moment when I decide, I feel like I choose to never give this kind of form problem a purpose anymore. That's the moment they cease to, 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 to show up in my mind as something that is important for me to focus on. And I believe, you know, it, I, I don't even care anymore whether they sh they're there or not. But I believe that's the only reason they will eventually cease to exist in my awareness because I, they don't have a purpose to exist anymore. So that's what we are here to do. That's the only way, you know, we can never hope to solve all the problems in the ego system. Our, our only way is to quit, to give them any purpose and remember let something else be born in this moment. So that's the birth of holiness to me. Yeah, I think that's, we'll try to, in our session tomorrow in the movie, is really bring, bring it in, because for this, this time of the year, uh, December, as we get towards Christmas, people always tell me 
they have heightened emotions. They don't know why they, they have such intense emotions. Uh, when they're around their family, all kinds of things that are under the surface start to come up. And where they were just kind of annoyed before, then when they're with the family, it goes beyond annoyance. It starts to get into some anger uh, and some struggle. And what Francis was just saying, like, this is the birth of holiness. This is, this is the time of letting yourself be lifted up truly into the holiness, into that, that, that realm of, of that which you were created. And let's talk a little bit about some practicalities. Like for most people, most people perceive that they have, they have a range of problems. Maybe there's interpersonal relationship problems with your, your partner, your family, your pets, the neighbors, the, the politicians you watch on the news. So there's some level of interpersonal problems going on. They believe they have some financial issues. Sometimes at the end of the year, when presents are being bought and, and there's not enough money to go around to afford certain presents, there's stress, there's financial problems that present themselves in awareness, uh, or there's health issues that Francis mentioned, symptoms and so forth. Let's talk a little bit about Albert Einstein now. <clears throat> Let's bring Einstein into this for those of you that are like, yeah, I'm. There's too much religious stuff around Christmas. Let's talk about Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said, you can't solve the problem at the level of the problem. So if you believe you have financial issues in time and space, Albert is sending a Christmas present to you through me. This is from Albert. I'm going to channel Albert now. Albert, the eminent scientist, Albert Einstein, you can't solve those financial problems at the level of, of finances. Isn't that good to know? That you'll never be able to solve financial problems at the level of, of finances? Isn't it good to know that you'll never solve those symptom levels, those sickness, sickness issues and projections on the body? You'll never solve them at that level. You won't solve those problems at the level of that problems. And you won't solve any of those issues that you have about politicians or the earth or global warming or on and on and on and on. You won't solve any of those issues. You won't even solve global warming at the level of, of, the, of the environment. What is going to solve all of these problems, it's the holiness of the right mind. The whole Course in Miracles is helping you discern between the right mind, which is the solution, and the wrong mind, which is the level of the false problems that have no solution, that, that uh, Francis has been saying, you will never solve the problems at that level. Frances tried, she was on diet regimens. Didn't you go through a, a pretty strict? Raw food. Raw food, diet regimens, you know, really going at it from, from the level of, of the, the body and food and nutrition and all that. And she went at it and then at, at some point there was a pop that she started to realize this isn't, after you started studying the course was when the pop came, was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to solve it. In fact, didn't you have a friend who, who became a famous YouTube? <laughs> she's, she's got more views than any of us will ever have. She became, uh, wasn't it about health coach, or something. Health coach and into yeah. vegetarianism? Yep. And she became hugely yes. famous, worldwide famous. Well, Francis decided, I'm going with A Course in Miracles and I'm going for the level of the solution. The level of vegetarianism and what I put into my mouth is not going to solve this ontological fall from grace, grace separation that I believe in with God. You know, and, and hallelujah for that because that was, it has to come to you in some form that really gets your attention. Something you really have put, put your mind in, the belief system in. And then you have a breakthrough. And then you start to realize, oh that's what Einstein was talking about. You can't solve the problem at the level of the problem. Meaning you can't 
solve any emotional or any kind of struggles and issues you're having in, in form, you can't solve them in the form. You have to choose the right mind. You have mm -hmm. to choose to be in alignment with God. God is not the creator of problems, so the right mind would simply be a reflection of that love and oneness that calmly forgives and looks upon the world with quiet eyes, it looks upon the world in stillness. It judges not. That's what the right mind is. It's just pure stillness and non-judgment. And that's the solution. That's why we're here joining together, is to come to that recognition together, like, oh my gosh, of course, it would have to be my holiness blesses the world. My holiness answers every seeming problem of this world. My holiness is how I am the light of the world. It brings holiness to all other minds. Through my forgiveness, my holiness blesses and, and brings holiness to every mind. That's still within the metaphor of separate minds, but bear with me there. You know, that's what, we're, that's what the Course is. It's saying, you have to let it be like a blanket of peace that just rolls out and spreads across the whole world. So that any appearance that you see is just covered in that love and that light of forgiveness. And it's doable. This is like why we're, we're here doing this. We're here joining together to, to recognize this together, to, to have our celebration of holiness together. <laughs> I see. I'm with you. <laughs> oh, precious. Precious, precious, precious. Well, we, we have some questions and that were written in and also uh, we always love yeah. to hear from you. And that's what these whole weekends are really about, is opening up and... Jean... Mm. Beaumont from France. She writes, Jesus, Spirit, I want peace. But there is a judgment. I want the happy dream. How can I ask for that when we are told that it is a, quote, early stage and ultimately I want to go beyond this? Ultimately, I want to see the dream is a dream and not real. I heard that we can pray to see the happy dream and pray for the kind of day we want. I have always resisted these prayers. What if what is best for me today is to go through and see some issue which may be very uncomfortable. I may suffer, so since I don't know what it is, what is the best for me, I can't even ask for a happy day! Exclamation <laughs> point. Please help me unwind from this belief that I can't ask for a day of peace, love and joy, and that it is okay to want the happy dream for now! Exclamation. Mm -hmm. I am reaching that, quote, edge Francis talked about. Spirit takes us just to the edge of what we can handle. I am there. I need a break! Exclamation point. I need peace! Exclamation. I don't think my body can take the level of stress and suffering I am living in for months! Exclamation. So it's beautiful. That is a heartfelt plea for, for us to join in because um, when we really call out for happiness, we are really bringing to the surface all of the beliefs and thoughts and expectations of what we believe we need to have a happy day. And so it's like going down the rabbit hole of the mind into emptying the mind of, of everything. When we really are praying for the happy dream, we are praying that prayer, let this, this year 
be different by making it all the same. We are praying for a, a, pers a different perspective on the world. We're, we're just praying to, to learn that we can care about our state of mind and that we deserve to be happy and, and we can learn to loosen our cares and concerns and worries about the form of things. It's the mesmerism of this world that has convinced us when we seem to come here of the importance of, of the world. And, and now the reverse amnesia is happening <laughs> where, where we're actually getting into the vibe of forgetting the world and remembering God. Mm -hmm. Forgetting it though in a, in a way that's guided because that's the only way that we can do it without fear. If we, we try to push it away or we try to suppress it or bury it, it, it will still be there to deal with. But when we allow just the daily guidance, just for this moment, to tune in and, and feel what is it that is best for myself, what is it that's best for the whole universe, we tune into that, then we're heading in the right, the right direction. And you shouldn't, shouldn't beat yourself up for even, even things that you seem to still notice that you want in the world. It's not that Jesus is asking us to be without anything. It's not that Jesus is saying you have to deprive yourself of something. It's more of a convincing job that's going on in the mind, and that's up to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is be willing to be convinced, but it's, you know, it's, it's going to have to come in a way that we can, we can handle it, that we can, we can take it. And I think when we feel like we have to do something to make it happen, that's where the pressure and the stress comes in. That's where we start to, to feel like I need to make a big move. I need to do something big and bold. Uh, when I feel like the, inviting the spirit is a very soft presence. It's a very soft invitation. But I really feel your heart. I really feel your heart because it's like that's, you're just calling, calling on the witnesses to come into your life to, to to convince you. You're, you're praying, please, I don't want to struggle mm. with this. Mm. Francis did a, we were at a conference, I think an Easter conference, where you did a whole talk on the choice for happiness. Mm. Like, of really coming down to see it really clear that it was a choice. Mm. Which takes it away from these uh, causation ideas of um, if this happens, I'll be happy, or that happens. Yeah. And even in your life, the way things have just fallen away, it, it just was a, it, like it was an obvious choice. It wasn't like you were in a point of struggle. It was more that, oh, the inevitable is happening, and, and good for that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is very freeing in the end to see that it's all up to what we want. And like what you said, um, Jin, you know, we can decide that we want a happy day. Actually, it's very, very important that we know that we can decide the kind of day we want. And that's all we can decide because we can't really decide on the form of things. The ego wants us to decide on the form so that, you know, we either have control or we can then relax. But that is an upside down thinking. All we can decide is that we're going to choose happiness today and let whatever happens, happen. And I just think, you know, at this point, when we talk about holiness, we, we know that there's so much love inside our heart, so much love that wants to be shared and extend. And, you know, when we talk about celebrating with families, that is where things also start to get tricky because we want to extend the, heart, the love in our heart, we want to have fun, but we don't know how to walk this line of no people pleasing, 
but still offer the love. And I think it is just, you know, remember, let us remember that we don't know what love is and we have to be guided. We can't allow things just to be compromised and take that as gestures of love to compromise what we feel in our heart. We have to be, you know, guided in those kind of situations. I had a recent incident, not so recent, but last this year, I think around June or something, I had um, a really loving dream. She, my mom showed up in my dream and I felt so much love. And waking up, I thought I would call her to, to extend this love. So I made the call and, and the moment I called, she was like, oh, I'm so glad you called. I'm thinking of coming to visit you in Mexico in January. What do you think? And I'm like, oh, that's not the reason I'm calling. <laughs> and she's like, nonstop, she made the plan. She's like, I'm thinking about it and I'm, ta I'm looking at tickets. I have time in January. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to be alive to see you. <laughs> oh, suddenly all of this guilt, just like, I said, oh, hold up. I, I don't even know where I'm going to be in January next year. It's too far away. Oh, you, you just don't put me as a priority. So all of this guilt just, <laughs> I said, okay, I, let me just, um, you know, like a regroup here. Cause that's not the, that's not the spirit of the call. That's not the why I called. And all of these guilt trips that start. So I kind of hang up just saying, let's not talk about this because I can't get into January yet. So I hang up and I thought, this is just feels so incomplete. And I have this love that I want to extend to her. And it's not the guilt. So after maybe a day, I called her back. And then she was like, what do you think about the January trip? I said, I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you about that because I, I want to talk, talk to you about this dream I have. And it was very difficult because in our language, we never say I love you. That word that just doesn't, doesn't um, we don't express in that way. So for me to kind of say, I feel so much love for you. I I feel my heart is with you and all of those things. And she just dumbfounded, like she didn't expect that at all. So, and after that, I thought, you know, what is truly called for when she was asking all this, why don't you this, why don't you that, is she was calling for love. And I am calling to express the love, but we don't have to compromise on the form level, we can just know the essence that we can meet in the essence. And that is, I feel like it's very, very freeing. Every time I practice that I'm speaking the truth to extend the love in my heart, it always feels very, very true, very freeing for me and for her and for both. So I really feel, you know, that's how our holiness can be burned through you know, through us expressing in truth, in, yeah. in love. Yeah, and there's such a spaciousness, because I know too that there was a time when, when uh, her mother was saying, come, I want to come to Utah, I want to come to Utah, and you said, okay, I will take time out, I will meet you, I will come to where you're going to be staying at a hotel, I will show Park you City, yeah. Park City, I'll show you Park City, Utah, I'll show you around. And there's a spaciousness, there's a time, isn't that a song? <laughs> to everything there is a season, <laughs> and a time to every purpose under heaven. That, you know, that it always is about being authentic, it's always about being in touch. And, and uh, even though there was a temptation to swing off into this other thing, you came back to your Martin Luther <laughs> right. King, I, Mom, I have a dream. <laughs> and in that dream I saw you, and I loved you. And, and I love you so much. You, know, you, you came back to the main theme, I had a dream. <laughs> so, you know, there's a time for everything. <laughs> you just had to, had to shift into the right gear. It took you a day, but you, you really got <laughs> oh, it's beautiful.
Oh, how sweet. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so thank much. Thank you for joining. <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> Love, love, love. <laughs>